Hola gamers and welcome back to the Kirby Marathon. The marathon where I review the games and you think it's lame. As you can see we've got a bit of an upgrade here. Look, there's even a moving background. Wow, so many new expressions. I wonder what they all look like stacked on top of each other. Okay, well, uh, not doing that one again. Today we're looking at Kirby's Adventure, which has been cited as one of the best Kirby games in the series. And it's the second one in the series. But does Adventure hold up? Spoiler, yes. Now as we all know, first impressions are everything, and clearly I messed that up by starting this channel with... Kirby has to be one of my personal favourite video games. Okay, you don't have to repeat. But what's the first thing you see when you boot up Adventure? Ah yes, the classic melody, an iconic instruction for how to draw Kirby. I mean, technically it doesn't work. If you draw based on the instruction, you get this, which doesn't work too well, but I mean, it's fine. DDD is back at his mischief again. He's stolen the vital star rod from the Fountain of Dreams, yes, the Smash stage, and given the pieces to his friends. Kirby and the rest of the Dreamlanders noticed this and awoke to having no dreams. Kirby is back at it again. Time to stop DDD and put his trouble to rest. Get it? Rest? Because, like, dreams. Like. Yeah. One of the first big differences with Adventure to Dreamland is this hub world. Worlds aren't commonly seen in 2D platformers, but the addition of fast travel between worlds and small condensed areas makes the concept work well. It's a cool way to segue to levels than just moving on a world map or automatically going to the next level. That being said, there is a ROM of this game that strings all the levels together like Dreamland, so that's important to keep in mind. The hubs include a bunch of other features, the claw game, the egg catching, quick draw, and the arena. Let me elaborate on them. The claw game acts just like real life crane games. Egg catching is very reactive and fast, quick draw is very reactive and slow, and the arena pits you up against one mid-boss. There are also ability rooms, with one to two abilities in each, which brings me to the next segment, copy abilities. That's right, baby. Now Kirby can absorb the power of his enemies and wield numerous powers and weapons. Now, these abilities aren't perfected, mind you. Most of them have only one or two moves, but just the fact of that they aren't temporary, like the first game's power-ups, makes a big impact on the game overall. I'll list the abilities here, but elaborate on some of the more important. We have Sword, Kirby's most iconic Zelda reference. Beam, Stone, Wheel, the best one. Cutter, Hammer, Parasol, Spark, Crash, Needle, Laser, which bounces off walls and slopes. Tornado, which makes Kirby an almost uncontrollable tornado. Mike, which returns from the first game. And UFO. Its ability to fly forever and shoot charged shots makes it very different compared to the rest. Those abilities are all pretty standard, appear in most of the games, all that. But there are some abilities which are dumb and stupid. Okay, so there are abilities that are repetitive because each ability only has one move. Fire and Fireball are different, Ice and Freeze are different, Throw and Backdrop are different. Look, I get these other ones, but for some reason someone had the idea to make a move where Kirby inhales the enemy. But instead of swallowing them, he throws them. Okay, dumb idea, sure. But then they made it twice. It's probably the dumbest thing in the game besides... Ball. So Kirby turns into a ball that's fully vulnerable until Kirby builds momentum from jumping. This basically means that attacking enemies and bosses boils down to mashing jump and slowly moving into the enemy. It's jank, it's inconvenient, and most importantly, it's bad. Then there's the useless abilities, high jump and light. High jump is sort of similar to ball, you attack by jumping into the enemy. And I have a feeling that they only made it for fighting Krakow, who yes returns, and he's doing just fine, kids are doing well, life's happy, all that. Even still, the ability is essentially useless. I'll admit that the way it's used in the Krakow fight is good, it's just that they dedicated an entire ability to it. Then there's light, which you probably won't believe is true. Get this. It lights up the room you're in, and then goes away. What? You're wondering what else? What do you mean, what else? That's it. Yeah, they made an ability that lights up a room. Uh, the ability is used about three times throughout the entire game, and each time it feels useless. The only time I thought it was used well is how it hides door entrances, and how using the ability revealed a hidden door. Otherwise, it's moronic. Of course I couldn't go without mentioning sleep, which is also useless, but at least it's intentionally useless. 
basically Kirby sleeps and that's all. It's pretty iconic, all things considered. Most first thoughts about copy abilities come to sleep, just for being the only joke ability. I think the best thing about these abilities is how they're used within the levels themselves. Certain segments of levels are specifically wired to use certain abilities, like for ball, fireball, wheel, parasol, stone, and laser, from what I noted down. It basically tests skills of abilities that affect your platforming, which tests your skills in numerous ways. This also causes enemy respawn to give the player multiple chances to complete the challenge. Overall, copy abilities are really great. Not only for gameplay variety, but also for the player choice of preference. And it's no surprise that they would become a staple of the series. Oh, and now Kirby can slide. Slide to the left, slide to the right. Kirby can run, which the absence of definitely made the gameplay in Dreamland slow, but the running definitely encourages more rushed gameplay, which would probably be a problem in the original. But the design mostly reflects this new ability for accommodation, as well as making Kirby way smaller, which is also probably done for the movement to the NES, bigger screens, all that jazz. Without bosses at the end of every level, a lot more occurring mid-bosses appear and provide with their corresponding ability. There's Bonkers, Mr. Frosty, Mr. TikTok, Rolling Turtle, Grand Wheelie, Bugsy, Fireline, and the returning Poppy Bros. Senior. Let's take a look at the world. So we have Vegetable Valley, Ice Cream Island, Butter Building, Grape Garden, Yogurt Yard, Orange Ocean, and Rainbow Resort. Following the trend with Dreamland, the first word of every world here is Vibgyor, which sounds dumb, but actually has a purpose. You see, if you reverse the phrase, it spells Roy G. Biv, which is an acronym used to identify the colors of the rainbow. It's a pretty cool secret, and I enjoy its inclusion just for setting the trends for the future games. On to the level design itself. It's very different to Dreamland in that there are 41 levels with varying different difficulties and lengths. There are levels which last an eternity and some which can be beaten in a minute. There are some throwaway levels, like Rainbow Resort 2 being a mid-boss rush, which feels like padding for the sake of including a whole bunch of levels, but it never gets too bad. Levels also can commonly feel unfocused in environments. You go through a door from a grassland and now Kirby has found himself in the depths of hell. There's even one example of a level that goes from a beach to a snow section to the clouds in one level, which isn't necessarily bad, but it can be confusing and make certain levels unmemorable and mesh together in your memory. That being said, there are design elements that are unique and memorable, like Great Garden 3, which features a swarm of blimps. Some levels contain hidden switches that open the hub a bit, and the methods for finding them can be well executed. Grape Garden 1, for example, includes another invisible door secret. You see, the formation of these blocks in this ball segment highlight this out-of-place spot in the pattern, and going through it leads to a secret switch. Butter Building features a unique visual gimmick where a couple of segments feature backgrounds that show Kirby wrapping around the building, which has to be one of my favorite visual components of any NES game. Let me check my notes for other pointers. Uh... Okay, so Orange Ocean features oceans that are orange. Good one, me. I think the final level, Rainbow Resort 6, is a great end. The entire level is a callback to the original game, grayscale and all, but just the fact it's a callback to the original game is a really great reward for those who are invested in the original. And the Green Greens theme is here and is remixed from the original. Speaking of music, masterful transition skills by me, the music is pretty great once again. Every overworld has its own track, and each level uses one of the one to three music tracks for each world. Everything is as memorable as you'd expect. In the Dreamland review, I mentioned how fighting the bosses are unique, but with the introduction of abilities, the combat is so much more varied. The thing is, the ability of choice lets you fight every boss with anything you want. You can take down every boss with no abilities or with whatever you find to be most useful. The new bosses are also great. Mr. Shine and Mr. Bright are a unique tag team duo. While one member attacks you directly, the other is attacking you from above. The bosses going into the sky even changes the actual time, which, while a cool mechanic game-wise, the idea of this happening in real life is terrifying. Imagine just going by your day job, but suddenly it becomes night time. The concept of these beings is extremely confusing, and you also kill them at the end of the boss, which would definitely destroy Kirby's solar system. Paint Roller is a cool concept. He moves between canvases, and the thing that he draws comes to life. I'd love to be able to do this, because then this thing that I made last time could be real. Heavy Mole is my least favorite boss. He spawns enemies that gives the hammer ability, but sometimes it's actually sleep. Also, the attacks he does are very hard to avoid when attacking up close with the hammer that the boss gives you, but he also digs through the ground at random, which may make a pit that will kill you. My worst experience with it was beating the boss but falling into a pit directly afterwards and having to beat the boss again. I don't like it. Then there's Meta Knight. Meta Knight is a May Stay series anti-hero, the original Shadow the Hedgehog, one may say. He has a sort of apprentice-master relationship with Kirby in this game, where he sometimes provides you with invincibility candy and also challenging you to a 
a fight with his band of troops, the Meta Knights. These segments are fine enough, except sometimes they appear back to back, which is a bit confusing. The fight itself also expands on this relationship, as he willingly provides you a sword for a one-on-one -on -one duel. Even his face looks like Kirby's to add to their close comparison. After storming through all the levels, Kirby makes it to DDD at the fountain. So after taking down DDD, the world is returned to peace, and Kirby and the Dreamlanders go back to a world of dreams. No, JK. So DDD split up the Star Rod because he wanted him to prevent it getting to the hands of a dark being known as Nightmare. Kirby placing the Star Rod back releases Nightmare and the final fight begins. But I'd like to mention the character building here. DDD grabs onto Kirby and tries to stop him in his own goofy way, but the cutscene also portrays all the information to the plot about Nightmare, or at least at the base level. You know he had good intentions and then it released Nightmare, but the epilogue at the end elaborates further. Some people criticize Kirby's actions here by not communicating with DDD about the situation, but I disagree for the important reason that DDD had already been established as a villain. By maliciously stealing all the food for himself, you can clearly see that DDD is greedy and therefore villainous. But by just hiding the Star Rod, he sort of just swept the problem under the rug, while Kirby is willing to actually solve the issue. Maybe if DDD had called up and been like, Hey, so slight problem, there's this demon thing that's trying to steal the Star Rod, could you like, stop it? And Kirby would say, <sighs> yeah, I'll be there in a minute. But for whatever reason, that decision feels like it would be out of place for characters who don't speak. Now Kirby has to fight the embodiment of nightmares. Nightmare. Subtle naming convention. Good one, Sakurai. The first phase is Kirby fighting the Nightmare Orb. He plays like a shoot 'em up, which is pretty cool. But the final phase? Who oh boy. Nightmare can only be damaged by the Star Rod when he opens his cloak, which makes the gameplay feel more like the original, waiting for an opening and punishing the boss for it. It's a unique kind of difficulty that I really enjoy. After taking down Nightmare, Kirby returns home after saying bye to DDD, and Kirby's adventure? has an extra harder mode to complete after the first one. This time the extra mode's a bit more simplistic, reducing Kirby's health bar to 3 instead of 6. It also doesn't have saves, so you have to beat it in one sitting. I can understand the limited features of this new mode, because this game is massive. It's taken a while to mention, but this game is the largest NES game ever made. And compared to other NES classics, it really shows. Super Mario Bros. has a simplistic graphical style, Zelda has samey environments, so on. Not to say they're bad, of course, but Adventure has to be the best NES game, at least in my opinion. And that concludes my video on Kirby's Adventure. Playing these games back to back really opened my eyes to the ambition of the HAL team, considering the only limitations of Dreamland was the hardware and the introduction of a new IP. Next time, we're going back to the Game Boy with Kirby's Dream Land 2. As of writing this, I haven't played it, but I have high hopes. Did you know that Kirby's name comes from the lawyer of Nintendo during their court case against Universal and the naming convention of Donkey Kong? That's why if I get a copper final, I'll have a good star for the name of my own video game character. I'll also be $40,000 in debt, so maybe not.